we were still beating, I think the first six or seven games, we might have won five games or something, but kind of like scraping wins, but we were still winning. And because we were winning, there was still a bit of a bad atmosphere. Edo, welcome to another edition of the No Choff Dares podcast on the OLB. I'm your host, Stel, and I've got my co-host here, Radio Roy, as well. I'm going to call him from now on since he's decided to fuck off to Sport 24 in Cyprus. And, you know, yeah. How's your, your radio debut, my friend, without me? Huh? They invited you one. Don't invite me. The Charlie, yeah? Is that how it works? Bro, you know, you know, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I gave you my respect respect that i gave you a shout out man it's okay it's okay it was, it was, it was nice man it was nice uh, it was relaxed it was nice for the podcast you know because the more people acknowledge us they give us the opportunity to speak on the radio where thousands of people can listen to what we're doing so like i always say we're a team so it doesn't matter if it's me or you man it's like you know what, what a center for says it doesn't matter if i score a goal it, it matters that the team wins. Are you making us sound like Siamese twins, mate? <laughs> Not that close. Jesus. Right, well, we have a very, very special guest. And as you can probably see from the image below, I believe he's below, so if I'm, I'm going to do the recording. Yeah, One of the funniest guys on the planet. Um, Killian Sheridan, welcome to the show, guys. How you doing? How you doing, yeah? I appreciate that um, intro. This got a lot to live up to now. Oh, come on, man. Come on. Those those tweets that you've been putting out for the past few years. I mean, Jesus. I, yeah. <laughs> you, you, tweets are different. Tweets are tweets are writing it down. You can think about it. Hold on a you second. Have, you, you, wrote, you roped in a journalist into believing one of your tweets and then you did some investigative work on him and then you rumbled him. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good one. Was it? Was it the Van? It was the Van Dyke one, wasn't it? About his his boots. Is that the run? The laces. Ah, uh, uh, it was the Liverpool one. I know that. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Because I remember you put a one about being on the same flight as Raheem Sterling, watching, watching Guardiola giving him pep talks, so to speak. Man, the the amount of people that that you've roped into is is fantastic. It's fantastic. But the thing is, they love it as well, man. And um, yeah, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward to it. Excellent. Likewise, mate. Well, Roy, do you want to start off the questions, my friend? Well, actually, I, I was hoping that you you was going to do the talking at the beginning. But yeah, I mean... Um, I just, just pass it over to me. Yeah? Just just make it... Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's... Just... That. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, well, I'll ask the first question then. So I know you spent quite a bit of time moving different clubs. You're at Kilmarnock, you're in uh, Bulgaria, you played for Celtic. And I'm not going to ask you the questions that you've been asked before about your time at Celtic because you've done that to death, so to speak. But you came to Cyprus and back then it wasn't as technically, uh, what's the word, advanced as what it is now. Okay, I wouldn't say it's technically advanced, but you kind of joined right around about the time there was a bit of a renaissance in Cyprus. I know Abwell were dominating. You Was it you won three titles there, if I'm not mistaken, when, when two, you were... Two. He was two. there for two years. He won two doubles. Two doubles. Yeah. And he had a goal. He scored a goal against Ayel. Uh, again, was it, was it Anothis' ground? And uh, yeah, kind of like a bit of a phantom match now because technically, I don't think it counted. Yeah, because it was yeah. it was it was one nil, and then they decided they went to a panel because the game was suspended. For people that are in the UK or that don't understand what happened, I know what happened. Roy knows what happened. But why was the game? replayed why did it have to be cancelled and then replayed uh crowd trouble crowd trouble <laughs> I'll, just, I'll leave it at that there was some crowd trouble and game was postponed game, game was cancelled deciding game of the league first versus second we had to win they just had to not lose and it must have been 60 minutes something happened and the, the game got cancelled so replayed while everything was up in the air, they decided, right, let's replay it. And then, yeah, I scored the one, we won one nil and I scored the goal. And then a week later, it goes to the decide, okay, we're awarding a three, three, three nil victory, I think it would have been. So, uh, do, you, do, you, do you speak with Kaka? Is, is he fine? Is he, is he fine after his, his injury? Uh, again? I, haven't spoke, I haven't spoken to him for a, for a while. But um, a, a bit of an exaggeration that day. Hmm? 
a bit of an exaggeration that day, you think? Or uh, no, I've never heard anyone say that at the club at the time. No one was. No one really. No one really felt that. I'm sure, obviously, it's what people will say, but I never, I never really had that feeling, or got, or got that feeling either. After, um, like pe people were saying, it was a tactic or such and such. But I mean, there was still, if it's the last minute and it happens and someone says it, then okay. But I mean, there was still 30 minutes left. Yeah. So I'm guessing, by the way, if it was around 60 minutes, I don't know when it was, but. Yeah, it was I mean, some. There was yeah. still a good chunk of the game left. Okay. Well, that's that's the. And only I would have, oh, I would have scored then anyway. <laughs> I would have scored then anyway. If I didn't score then, I would have scored the next game. <laughs> oh, mate. Well, look, I know Palo Sergio signed you, and you did pretty well against Hearts. Which is, you think that's one yeah. of the reasons why he came in for you? It certainly would have helped. I'm mm. sure it might have caught his eye, and then he's maybe looked at me playing. Uh, and fancied me. Um, well, I, yeah, when when I first went over there, I see. The, I think I went because of my time in Bulgaria. Excuse me. Um, because of my time in Bulgaria, I was, oh, I was like twenty one. I was over there on my own, just not living right, like not not doing the right things, and. I was kind of so focused on not making the same mistake that I kind of wasn't really like putting myself out there or, or doing much. And I think at the beginning, I, pro I probably struggled a bit in that way. I pro probably wasn't really being myself. Um, and I think that kind of held me back a little bit at the start. Um, so I pro that's what, one of the things when I went there first, I would have liked to have I've started off a bit better. So coming from Scotland, obviously, as you said yourself, you're in Bulgaria. I guess Bulgaria and Cyprus, you've got a similar kind of culture. Uh, I'm not going to ask you how easy it was for you to, to settle because I guess English is a second language in Cyprus. But um, you coming from a massive club like Celtic to Abuel, who, let's be fair, they are one of the biggest clubs on the island. Um, in terms of the expectancy from the supporters, did you feel that this was a club that had to win titles every single season? Uh, not when I first went. Like when I first went there, I didn't realise the pressures or like how big the club was in Cyprus, first of all. Um, and probably, like I'd probably add that into a factor in, in having a slow start there. Uh, and then the other part of it is like you were saying about I was at Celtic, so you've got like the being at a big club in a country or a country's biggest club. It's like when I was at Celtic, I was a youth player. I was never really one of the, the first team players that's going to be recognized all the time every every time I'm out on the street. Whereas in Cyprus it was different. I was every everyone would would recognize me. And that probably took a little bit of getting used to. But it was probably the first time really I'd had that. Oh, that's fair enough. I mean, the, the reason I ask is because, you know, you mentioned just then that you weren't like a first team at Celtic, but you, you kind of knew the ethos of the club and what the, what the expectancy was. I, I guess that from a youngster, you guys would have been told, right, these are the standards that need to be met. So this is what's to be expected. Granted, you know, it's still, you had Rangers, you had other clubs in there like Hearts, I guess, and, and Hibernian, Aberdeen as well, who rich history with, with Alex Ferguson back in the day. But at the same time, you know, that that pressure from coming from Scotland to Upwell, a club, as I said, expected to win titles, expected to challenge week in, week out, with constant managerial changes, with players on big wages. I mean, even John Arnarisa came to Cyprus as well. So it must have been a little bit, I wouldn't say nervy for you, but were you a little bit wow, like what what, what the fuck's going on kind of thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it took me back a bit. Um, I, I like I've said this a few times that I, I underestimated the football in Cyprus. Like I think a lot of people in the UK would do. Like how, how did view football in Cyprus? Um, 
and that probably surprised me a bit at the start. Uh, and then kind of like the the relationship clubs have with fans in Cyprus is totally different to to what it's like in the UK. Um, or, and not only Cyprus, it's, it's more the UK to the rest of Europe, like kind of Eastern kind of Europe. Yep. And it's, to, it's totally different. So you've, the first time something happens, like if the fans come to training and let you know things aren't acceptable, you're kind of like, whoa, what's this? And then it happens, it happens again. And then you kind of, you realize, okay, this is, this, this is how it is. This is the expectations. If you're not winning, if you're not playing well, then you're going to know about it. Not, but, but, did, not did, like, but did you get that by all though? Because they were winning titles, as Roy said, you know, you won two consecutive titles, two doubles. Well, did that sort of thing happen there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, really? we did a bad start. We, um, that, that first season we won the league, we were, we were, I think, 12 points behind. Um, IL, I think, were pretty much first maybe the whole season. Um, and obviously that's why Paolo Sergio got, got sacked because we were lost lost a lot of games and obviously maybe not lost all the games but we weren't winning the games we should have been winning and we got knocked out of Europe and then got luckily got picked out of a hat to, to go into the Europa League um, so at the start I found out pretty quickly like it's what their expectations were right so they, they kind of gave you one more chance right and you know, you stepped up. You did remarkably well your first two seasons. Um, played in the Champions League against Barcelona, Paris Saint-Germain, uh, Ajax, if I'm not mistaken. But you told Messi to fuck off, didn't you? <laughs> I know, that he- that headline kills me because people... Are- <laughs> it was. I was trying to explain how before the game you see them in the tunnel and you're like, okay, that's... That's messy. That that's the time when you're kind of like in not starstruck or in awe, but you you realise who you're playing against. But then as soon as you're in a game, you're not you're not go you're not thinking Messi has the ball and there's a 50-50. I can't I I can't possibly go in and tackle Messi. Like I can't foul him or hurt him or upset his feelings. Or it's and I was kind of saying like yeah, like if something's happening and tell them, oh, fuck off, that wasn't a foul, something like that. Mm. And then, yeah, they printed, I told them to fuck off. And... <laughs> well, these, you're, you're right there. Because if, it's... If, I had to, if I had to, I would, but I don't think I did. I don't think I ever did. <laughs> well, look, mate, listen, you, you know as well as I do, it's a competitive sport. So 50-50 is all right, 50-50 challenges these days. You see a lot of players ducking out of it, especially in the Premier League, but I'm not going to get into that one. But it's, it's almost as if, you know, you're right. You can't be in awe of these players because it's like what they say. You've won the game in the tunnel when you got the likes of Messi and Suarez and all these other players. They're probably thinking, fuck, like, we ain't going to beat these guys. But, you know, you were quite unlucky against them, to be fair. Am I wrong? The first game, yeah, the first game, we I think it was just the best time to play them. We could have played them. It was uh, Louis, Louis Enrique was the manager. And it was his, he had just been appointed manager. And Suarez had that ban. Uh, so he wasn't playing the first game. And they weren't really ticking like they were later on in that season. Because um, they beat us with a set piece. They beat us with a PK scored a header. Um, but at, we didn't really create much. I think Manduka might have had a chance near the end. Uh, other than that, yeah, I, th- I think we we could have come away like 0-0, zero, zero, a draw in the new Camp, which obviously is, would be an unbelievable result. Um, but I think for later on in that group, the, we could have done the home game with Ajax, we should have won. Mm. I, missed, I missed a header that I've regretted so much. Was well, that stuck with you? Yeah, it's, it's one one of the chances like that I always think about. Because if I score that, then I've got I've scored in the Champions League. I know I've scored qualifying goals, but like a Champions League group stage goal is 
would, would be something to have. Yeah, of course. For a team yeah. like Arboa or against big big names like that. But um, go, going back to the domestic side then, so you, you know, you're playing Champions League football against these teams and then you're steamrolling the rest of the league. I think you beat Unorthodoxy 8-1 once, if I'm not mistaken, um, back in the, 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 was it before the playoffs have started? Again, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So when, when you're playing Barcelona, Paris Saint-Germain with, with Ibrahimovic, um, et cetera, et cetera, and then you're playing domestically, Omonia this season, we've we've noticed a difference in terms of their performances, you know, playing Europa League football and then playing domestically. Um, I'm not saying the players' heads weren't in it, but uh, from a physical and uh, just a physical standpoint, you could, you could tell the difference. The demands are higher in Europe, whereas domestically, it's not the same. So results were kind of a bit iffy domestically. So when you guys were in the league, you were still steamrolling teams. Now, are we talking about the levels... Uh, of the league in terms of ability have improved now? Or would you say that back then you guys were just so good it wasn't even a thing? No, that that season we were in the Champions League, there was a stage where I thought we wouldn't lose. I was like, I just felt so confident that we were winning, that we were going to win every game. And then I think we lost uh, just before December. Just before the breakup for the that little Christmas breakup, I think we lost with Aramis at home or away. I'm not sure. And yeah, up up until then, I I, I thought this no no one was beating us. Just like sometimes you just have that confidence that the team's going to win. Um, and I think we just had that. Every it, there was no. I think because we had a good squad as well, you knew that if you didn't play good after a European game, someone someone was going to come in and, and could take your, your place. And then you didn't want to lose your place and not play a Champions League game. And because the teams we had in, in that group, every every game was like a like a prestigious game that you wanted to, to play against, like big stadiums, big teams. Um, so that I remember kind of always having that in my head, that's like, if you get in the team, stay in the team. It doesn't matter who you're playing. Because I'm pretty sure our first game after we played in the new camp, the next game we played away to Ayanapa. And I remember thinking like, from basically like what I've just said, from the new camp to playing... Ian Appa. Um, and I just, I just always was thinking at that time, like, don't give a reason not to, to play in the next Champions League game. Understood, mate. Understood. Well, I've got one more question uh, with regards to your time at Abuel, because obviously this is an Omonia show, so I'm going to be talking too much about that lot. But um, going back to what I mentioned about the quality. So, you know, you're in the tunnel before every game. You've got, as you mentioned, Manduka. You've got so many other players. Uh, Di Vicente was there, if I'm not mistaken. And then you're looking at your opponents and you're like, okay, right, we, we've got this one in the bag. Did you ever face any opponents that felt, right, we're going to get stuck into these guys? Kind of like you would expect in the UK, you know, a big club against a, a smaller club. Get stuck in, get right up them and uh, see what they're made of. Uh, no, no. I don't, I don't remember anything like that. The, the only thing was, the only time it might have been like that was in the qualifiers when we played, uh, the first one we played Helsinki. Right. And then Alberg, Alberg. So both Scandinavian, mm. Scandinavian teams. And I kind of remember thinking the games that we played, because both away legs, or sorry, both second legs were in Cyprus. And kind of like the emphasis was put them under pressure, like not by pressing them and getting into them, like you were saying, like UK kind of mentality, but more with the ball, like always attacking. Because you know, you know those teams struggle with the heat yeah. in that time. So if you if you can like keep putting pressure on them for the for the, the first like 50, 60 minutes. They're, they're gonna they're gonna get tired. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm gonna hand you over to Roy in just a moment. You you joined the money in 2015. Um, again, speaking to a lot of Amonia fans, especially those on Instagram that have 
bombarded us with questions to ask you, which we'll do near the end. Um, obviously, there's this massive love for you from from our supporters. Do you, do you still feel that from? Did you sorry? Did you have that from the Abuel fans? That kind of that love that obviously your money fans are, are showing you now. Because every money fan I speak to, they're like, oh "My God, we love this guy!" Like they put you up there, man. Um, yeah, it was, it was weird. Like I had it from everyone used to say when I moved clubs, like how was it like from from fans? But I think the way that I left, it was. I'm not. I'm not Cypriot. I'm not. I wasn't like saying no to one and to join another, or like telling one I don't want to be here. I'm. I'm going over there. Um, and I think the way that worked out, I kind of felt. I never really had any bad feelings from from Apoel fans. Always like, anytime I'd meet them out and about on the street, they'd, they'd talk nice to me. Even when we played them, they weren't too like. Obviously, like whistling a bit when I had the ball, but nothing, I don't remember anything like really bad being said to me. Mm. Uh, and then on, on the ammonia thing was, uh, yes, I, I always felt um, the, I don't know, like the support and I kind of knew that they liked me, but I knew they liked me because I was, I was playing good. If you're like, you have to be playing good for for fans to like you, or you have to be doing something for them to like you. You can be a, a good person and be funny and all that, but if you're not if you're not playing good, then it's going to be that like that that's going to be a bad thing about you. That's going to be and they'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be ah, you're, you're joking too much, or you're you're mm. not, not serious about that. So um, yeah, but yeah, that's echo what you said at the start like I've, I have always felt felt the support from from both of them brilliant cheers mate Roy yeah uh, well yeah actually I want us uh, I want you to remind us a little bit uh, how you moved from Abel because like we mentioned in the beginning you know you won the double twice you scored some decisive uh, goals for Abel and then uh, what happened how did you decide did you say, you know what, I like Cyprus and I want to stay here and Omonia is the club. I, I, want, to, I want to play football. Do you have other offers to, to leave from Cyprus? What, what made you decide to go to Omonia? Obviously, what you said was true because I think that uh, you're probably the only person who played for both the clubs and, uh, you know, they, they, they really like you and they respect you. And, you know, I, I've seen tens of players playing both clubs, but with you, it was really different. But that obviously happened after you left. So you, did, you didn't really know that was going to happen before you decided. So that was another factor you have to bear in mind. So do you want to tell us a little bit on how did you decide to come to Omonia? Who approached you? What happened a little bit like a sto story that we don't really know? Uh, it was basically... So my my contract at Apoel had finished, and they didn't they didn't want to want to renew or, or offer me a new one. So then I was the free agent. Um, I hadn't I hadn't even I, I didn't speak to any teams or anything before that because um, it was kind of like until the very last. It might have been the day after the the last game of the season, um, when I still really didn't know what was happening. Um, and then I had a few, there was a, a few clubs in Cyprus were interested, uh, mostly, mostly the, the top like four or five teams outside Apoel basically. Uh, and I spoke with uh, Kaifas, Ka Kaifas? Yeah, Kaifas, Kostas Kaifas. Kaifas, yeah. Um, and he, basically on the phone he was, the most eager like he I had the feeling that he he really wanted me the most um, not to say that that the other teams didn't like show me something like that but I just felt that he was the most kind of um, insistent on it and would like phone me and say look I want 
I watched it, really like you. I want you to come. Uh, have a few days to think about it. And then he phoned me back, see, like, how are you thinking? What are you feeling? Uh, and basically, that's that kind of feeling of he really wants me, he really wants me there to, um, to join. And then it was, I would have, if I wasn't just at Apple Well, I would have just, I probably would have been like, yeah, straight away. Because that's that previous season, I remember Ammonia playing playing really good and we struggled a few times uh, against them. And then the only thing that, that was holding me back a bit was the fact going Applewell to Ammonia. Uh, and then that's, that's probably what took us, I think it, it might have been a week or two in between from when... From when I was a free agent to signing, it might have been one week or two weeks. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, that, that that was basically it. It was um, just just true true speaking to him. Mate, okay. did did it help that Gaffer was a club legend, and for him to be so enthusiastic about signing you was that kind of like wow, you know, he's you know he's a rival club, but yeah, he's a club legend, head coach, and and he wants me here. Was that the 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 carrot on the stick, so to speak? Uh, yeah, yeah, it yeah, it helped. Like it's you know you'll always hear players say it when a lot of times the deciding factor can be you just felt that that club wanted you the most. Um, and then I think because I knew it, it was that, but also how good I remember Ammonia being that previous season. The fit because they finished quite high, no. I can't, I can't remember where they finished. But... Your, your, I think your first season we finished fourth. Rob, right, was it a 2014 15 season? Is it third? Uh, yeah, I think I think Kylian's talking about it. Might have been close. It oh. might have been close, like between second, third, and fourth. Yeah. Um, but I just remember from playing from playing against them that I was like, that's that looks like a pretty good team to to play in um, for a striker. And First season, it, it proved kind of to, to be right. Yeah. Um, so the, the first game you played was it with Jagiellonia when you scored the the goal? Was that your first game with Omonia in Europe? No, first game was Batumni. Ah, ne Badumi, ne Badumi, ne ne ne, and then and then it was Jagiellonia. Ne. Yeah. And the, fir- the very first game we played away with Batumni, and I didn't, I didn't even come on. We lost one, one nil, and I didn't come on. And I remember thinking, like, this is weird. <laughs> but at the end, Pote was still there. Yeah, I think he he played that game, um, and then the second game I came on, and I might have set up the goal Skembri scored. Yeah, we missed, a, we missed a penalty that game. I didn't take it. Yeah, you did. That's how I got Took to take with Broadby. That's how I got to take the next penalties we got because Gulan missed the penalty in that game. Yeah. And yeah, and then my first proper game was was with uh, against Jagalonia. And we we beat them one nil, wasn't it? No. Yeah, so we drew nil nil in Poland, and then in Cyprus we won one nil. Yeah, I remember that game. I was there, and I scored. So yep. it helped. It helped when you score early on. When you join yeah. a club, it's a massive, massive help. Instant impact. And, that's what you need. And they remembered that a year and a half later, when you, when you, when they signed you, like Alonia, wasn't it? You know, because you scored against them. They probably that played the role for you to sign for them a year and a half late, so wasn't it? I think I think similar to the Paolo Sergio thing, I think it might have put me on the radar. Um, yeah. I'm I'm not entirely sure, but I've, I've, it's something I never actually asked. Um, but I know I remember at the time that coach at Jagalloni, he it was kind of done. I had the feeling it was done the kind of like that British way of if a manager likes some players, the club signs the players the manager wants. It's not uh, like 
a director's signing players that a manager doesn't really know about. So I think it was, I think it was because I'd played against them. Yeah, but bro, when you joined Omonia, I think we made about nine, ten signings that summer. And I think the same amount of players left. I remember Foffy left that summer, didn't he, Roy? Didn't Foffy leave that summer? End of August? Yep. And Baudet left as well. But, you know, it, it must have been difficult, not just for you, but for the whole team. And Gaiafa, especially when you've got so many players coming in at the same time. And don't forget, we won the title like five years prior and players like Leo was still there and they, they'd left that summer. So it's almost as if it was like a massive transitional period. But it, it kind of continued to be a transitional period with the shit constantly hitting the fan. Yeah, it's... it's... That's one of the things when things aren't going good, it's so hard to to change things around quickly to get a quick um like impact of all so many changes. Uh, and I think I'd probably say that's what hurt us the next season. Because the next season was an even bigger change when we had Dabiz as in as the director and like it was just a completely different structure. So there was you had the turnover of all the players and the coaching, but also the, the other structure of the club changed as well. Um, and it was hard, like a club at Ammonia, it's hard to it's hard to have a slow transition. Like they're not they're yeah. ex- fans expect the club to be to be winning, so it's hard to to have a one or two seasons where you're going to have to say, look, it's, things aren't going to be too good for these seasons. Um, like you, you, you can't say that, or, or you can't even start the season with those expectations. Mm. Um, so it's like you're saying with the a, a turnover of players is always is always difficult. But don't forget, I mean, when you were up well, there was a much more structured dynamic at the club, wasn't there? And then you come to a morning where we know about the financial difficulties. We've spoken to many players, uh, Fredji being one of them. We had Skembri on uh, a few weeks ago and he was telling us how difficult it was at the time at the club. Um, and then Dabizas comes in with John Carver. Obviously, Miljovic had a bit of a, a, a short stint. But when you saw Dabizas come in and you saw, I, I presume you guys saw a few changes being made in the background and, and the structure of the club and the way that the mechanics, so to speak, did you at any point or the rest of your teammates around and say, right, fuck, you know, things are changing now. We really need to step up. Or was this attitude pretty much the same? We just go out on the training pitch, give it all, we'll go back on the pitch, listen to the coach, do our job. And if the results come, they come. Uh, no, I think it was just, there was so much trying to be changed. And it was, just, it was hard to, like I was saying, it's hard to, to have all those changes. And, Everything just to, to to continue, not not even just to continue as they were, like results wise, the club is doing well, or not not doing well, but like is in the top end of the table is challenging, but to also make the changes, obviously because you want to go better, it's hard to it's hard to suddenly just change everything, uh, a new approach, new ideas, and. When, when players come in and it, it, was a, it was a weird start because I remember we started that season okay, but because we weren't maybe playing re, such good football or because we weren't beating teams like 3-0 or three or four goals every game, we were still beating, I think the first six or seven games, we might have won five games or something but kind of like scraping wins, but we were still winning. And because we were winning, there was still a bit of a bad atmosphere, like almost like a disappointment that it's, it's still not good enough. And then it was hard when the results actually weren't going good. It, it just made everything uh, like more magnified and, and, and then more intense. So... Uh, what was it? Was it fans or the press where you felt the the pressure more? Because I understand that a lot of fans are close to the players. You go to a coffee shop, they won't leave you alone. Um, you know, you got the press constantly hounding you. It's not like the UK where they're literally in your bins taking photographs. But I guess press conferences or when you're out and about, you're gonna have people constantly slandering you. And obviously, you wouldn't know the language, 
But at the same time, you're obviously being told these things from your teammates. So I guess it must have upset the, the team morale, surely. Uh, yeah, the no, the, the press or the, the media didn't really bother me or, or even the fans saying stuff or the pressure from the fans didn't really bother me. Um, it was probably just because there were so many, so many different things coming in and players that would be coming in that wouldn't be used to it. Because I was thinking, like, when I came into Apoel or, like, into Cyprus straight away, and I remember thinking the first time, like, going through a bit of a bad patch, and that was at Apoel when they just won the league. They've been in Europe. Everything is everything was still good for the club. And I still found this, like, oof, that, that was pretty tough like so if you're if if you've got all that plus you don't have all that behind the club of the success to kind of like cushion it a little bit it just kept, it just kept getting we just keep getting worse and worse and for players that would, wouldn't have had of had that before it would be it's a big a big ask um for players, and, and not just a few, because there were so many new players as well, um, it, it would have been difficult. Did any struggle to get settled, do you think, like family-wise? Because obviously you go out there, different, you were already out there, so to speak, but these guys that came from different nations, didn't speak the language, perhaps they didn't have any teammates that spoke the same language. Do, do you, did you see any struggle? Uh, no, no, there was nothing like... There was nothing in a training or the training ground where you'd feel like oh, I was like bad, like it, there was there was a bad environment or anything. There was nothing like that. Like everything was, we'd go in, we'd try and be as positive as we could after after a bad time, um, but it just it just kind of was growing and growing and like one of the hardest things in football is to get confidence when things aren't going good. Our team doesn't have confidence, isn't playing with confidence. It's it's the hardest thing, and it's the worst thing as well because you know what it is. Like you know, you're you're doing everything during the week. You're you're everyone was training good, trainings were good. We had good fitness coaches, good coaches, everything. But confidence, like if if a team doesn't have confidence, it's it's not something you can train on. You can't train like. You can train your finishing or fitness, but trying to get confidence, it just comes from, from winning and, and doing well. And we were just kind of always chasing that and just ne obviously obviously ne never getting it. I think it's great that you're, you're another player that's basically knocked something on the head here because a lot of players that we've spoken to about on morning during their time when the club was going through a difficult period, financially especially, they didn't let that, bother them it, it didn't play a part in their performances they just remain professional again you, you know you're another one of the players that says right whatever happened in the background there's nothing to do with us like as long as you know we got paid and whatnot that got sorted and eventually you got paid <laughs> eventually but you know it, it didn't it didn't prevent you guys from playing the game as you just said it was about confidence results when when coming but when Carver came in him from the UK he claimed to be at one time, I don't know if you know this, Roy, but John Carver once said that he was one of the best coaches in the UK. Um, yeah. And that was a big thing to say, a big, big thing to say. And he came to Cyprus, I believe that he was on his way to Las Vegas before he got a phone call from, from Dabizas uh, for him to, to come to Cyprus. What was he like from a tactical perspective? Because he did remarkably well in the background for Newcastle. Let's not make any bones about it. He did very well for him, very well for him. Um, but it's a shame that he didn't get the, the opportunity to kind of do things his own way inside because I remember the last time we spoke on the podcast, Killian, I was saying like, maybe he needs an opportunity. He definitely needs the opportunity to kick things on. And then fast forward, I think it was seven, eight months. And that was it. He was only there for seven, eight months. Um, yeah. Yeah. He was, um, I had him when I was at Plymouth, he came in as the assistant coach, but I had him very briefly, very briefly. Um, but like training wise, Coaching, excuse me, um, coaching and the training, like he put on some of the best training sessions I've had. I mean, like we do finishing drills after training. Uh, he'd do them and he was, he's definitely more of a coach 
I feel like, because not often after training, if you're doing extra drills, it's normally an assistant coach or another coach is, is will take those stuff. I, the, the manager doesn't really do those the, those extra drills after the training, um, and and he'd always he'd always stay back and uh, the Jor- Jorgos Simos Jorgos Simos yeah. was the assistant. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in Aussie this yeah. year, and and the 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 two of them would would always stay back. So it was a bit like it was strange for the manager to be doing that extra, but that's just. If you're a coach, you're a coach. You you want the coach, like you want to put on sessions, um, and like I'd, I'd back up how good how good a coach he was. The like from from the sessions he put on, but I just think he just came into a, into a hard a hard environment at the time. Like it was like I was saying, like you can do everything on the training, but if the team just can't win. And you need you need wins, you need one win then to, to get on a little roll and, and then you've got confidence back. But we just it was just hard to get. I just remember like games were there was never I don't remember really I don't remember a game where we were up by a few goals and like enjoying it. You were just kind of always Yeah, it was scraping victory. Yeah, you were just thinking just win the game. We just need to win this game. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Roy, I, I kind of hijacked your questions, mate. Sorry. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah, you, you, yeah, I was about to say that, you know, now I'm a bit confused because <laughs> I was waiting for my time. But yeah, never mind. I mean, Killian answered some of the questions I had in mind. But uh, yeah, I was going to ask, you played for both the teams and I'd like you to compare the two clubs. Did you feel... Any differences between the two clubs? Obviously, you said that at the time, Abel was a bit more structured. They were winning titles. They were an up. But that's the club. What about the, the general atmosphere you felt with, with, with the fans mostly? Uh, were any of the fans different to you or did all of them seem the same to you? The way they approached you, the, the pressure you might have felt, the love you might have felt, the support and all of that? Because obviously... Even though we're talking about the two biggest clubs in Cyprus, it was at a time where, you know, Apoel was at its peak and Omonia was struggling mostly financially, but then otherwise as well because of the financial problems. But uh, how did you how did you receive all that as a player and the comparison between the two? But not as far as the, the club, but mostly, like I said, the fans and, and all of that. Uh, I'd pr- it's probably kind of a boring answer but I'd say there were a lot of it was I kind of felt the same from both of them I never felt I never felt like they're better than them or like a big difference in that way or their like mannerisms um, also it's like I would, I would have obviously loved to go gone to Ammonia and won won something with them, or won a league, or won a cup, or something with them. And then you've got all the fans that I knew was there, but you've got them when you're winning. Like yeah. to, it, it would it would have made a, a huge difference, I'm sure. Like a, it would have made it even better. It was was like there was no, nothing bad. In, in terms of that but if if it was winning and I had like you could experience all all those fans yeah in a winning uh, environment and a winning team it, w- it would have been a difference obviously, obviously it would have been different and then the other way if I was at Applewell and we weren't doing well it's probably going to be a different experience as well so it's um, it's, it's probably like kind of almost the tables of turns now where Ammonia is on top and doing well and, and Apoel are struggling, so it's... Never um, mind. <laughs> <laughs> <Well, no. laughs> uh, yeah, so, okay, the other question I wanted to ask, which, again, sort of answered, um, how was the dressing room like? I mean, we mentioned in the introduction that you're one of the 
funniest uh, guys and you were fun and you spoke to quite a few players that mentioned especially Scambri he mentioned you that you went to his wedding as well in Malta and they were really fun okay but you were a professional you, you were a good player so let's not make a mistake about that you know it's, but do you remember stories like back uh, in the day in the dressing room or, or because of the atmosphere and, and the pressure you felt you weren't really having those laughs in the in, in the dressing room um, do you remember any stories like um, funny stories that you want to share with us at the time in Omonia or like there's something that stood out or uh, uh, put me on the spot here uh, you're thinking about ones you can repeat can't, aren't you <laughs> <laughs> I've heard stories from football yeah, yeah, so the, the first season when I went in from like from the first minute, you'd know Scambry was is Scambry. Like he's going around talking to everyone, introducing, real friendly, really nice guy. And then it was a shame he wasn't there for the second season. Yes. Um, and then the second season, when Matt came, Derbyshire, it was the first time I'd had someone from the UK. So, like, I would have had. It would be totally out of totally different humor with Matt than I would with the with the other guys. Like my my humor with Matt would be more dry and uh, compared to how it would be with um, with the other guys. Uh, stories. I can think of a story. Uh, from those seasons. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, let me help you out here, yeah, because a, a certain gentleman that you just mentioned messaged me to say, um, Matt said you couldn't down a certain drink at his house one time. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. No. There's no um, proof, so. <laughs> well, he, he sent me a sick no. emoji afterwards, so. <laughs> there's, no, there's no picture, there's no video. Of Didn't happen, yeah, so, fake news, yeah. So, allegedly. <laughs> well, have, you, have, you, have you got anything about Matt so I could throw back at him balls in your court now man uh, oh. well, so, something will come to me something will come to me <laughs> let me let me think of something uh, shall, shall, we, shall we move on and let you give you the chance to, to think about it yeah move on and, and I'll come to one I don't want to waste time <laughs> All right. Right, you've got any more questions mate yeah, basically, uh, we, we, we're going cl closer to the quick five questions, which is going to be questions from fans that they asked us to ask you. But be before we, were, we go there, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about... Um, okay, I asked you for a funny story, and, and you said you're going to remember one. So for you to try real hard, mustn't, mustn't have had so many fun stories, but uh, uh, any, anything else like from your time in Cyprus or Omonia that, you know, you, you haven't shared this far and, and you'd like to share it with us now or like something you'd like to say. Um, okay, obviously if, if, if you don't want to, you don't have to, but like any, anything else like, uh, from your time here in Cyprus, I can't think of, I can't think of any those funny questions stories. are easier. I can't think of any funny stories. <laughs> the, the thing is, yeah, like we, we could we could go to Cyprus, like from the UK, we go to Cyprus, we go to Napa, we go to all these different clubs, and we come back with all these stories about getting pissed and ended up in, in, in swim pools and shit. But you guys are professional footballers, so those kind of stories I, I wouldn't expect. Um, I wouldn't expect like a, a kind of Stan Collymore story where you're setting off fire extinguishers in hotels or, <laughs> or, or players falling out of windows and shit. You guys had to maintain that professionalism, but the thing is, in Cyprus, everything is 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 they, they find your sense of humour amazing because they're not used to it. I think that is that not right, Roy? You know, when when I do my Instagram videos, I get so many people from Cyprus messaging me like about how how funny I am. I'm like, well, that's that's just how we are in the UK. But I think because that sense of humour kind of gets lost 
on the aeroplane between the UK <laughs> and Cyprus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's yeah, almost well. as if like they're expecting a, 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 you know a brand new story left, right, and center. But um, I, I, you know, listen, winning the title in Abu, you must have had some parties here and there. You know, that's what I I assume anyway. Uh, so my when the first year when we won that league. Uh, so obviously it was after the IL game mm. and I'd scored the goal and everyone was obviously going back to because the season had been extended I had to delay my holiday and whatever two or three days so I was due to go to Portugal like two days previous or one day previous so I went from the sta- from Anortis' stadium. I went direct to the airport. I didn't go back to Nicosia to, to celebrate or anything. So you had your suitcase packed and all that and went to Lanark Airport. <laughs> well, I, was getting, I was getting videos of people on the, the highway, on the bridges, <laughs> and getting videos from the guys from like Antoniadis and uh, who else would have been? Uh, Christophides would have been sending me pictures of our videos like when they were out with fans singing my name and I didn't I didn't get anything till like the next morning because uh, I was traveling and I was going so I, w- I went straight to holiday in Portugal um, the, the next day the next day yeah and you missed out all the celebrations I missed, I missed all the <laughs> celebrations and then the second season the second season it was pretty low key. It was, mm. There wasn't much. Um, what about the celebrate the goal celebration against Addis, where you celebrated in front of no fans for Monia? Yeah, cheap, cheap laughs that one, wasn't that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was hilarious. That looking back at that, I was better. Uh, um, that, that's, that, that was a, more like a soccer AM kind of moment, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm really so letting you down here. No, no, man. No, 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 no. It's like, because you know what, what's going to happen? You're going to come off and you'll be like, oh, man, I remember this. I completely forgot to tell these guys. You know, that's that's fine. Listen, uh, I'm sure we'll do this again again sometime. But um, I've, I've got some so I've got some names. I'll tell you what, I'm going to try something different, yeah? I'm going to give you four names, right? And yeah. I want you to just give me a, a breakdown of how you would explain or just describe them to an alien, Yeah. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Nuno Assis. Nuno Assis. Um, to, an, to an alien, how would I describe them? Or just anyone that doesn't know who this footballer is, how would you explain them? Uh, explain what they're like in terms of their ability and all that? Uh, I'd say if you want to make a good impression, good first impression, uh, offer them a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Obviously, see, he that should be the ad for for cigarette companies trying to. <laughs> it's just lighting one up, yeah. Trying to sell cigarettes, like, look, I don't think they're that bad for you. Look at look at the shape he's in. <laughs> when I he would have been thirty six that season, thirty six yeah. or thirty seven, and he was so good. Like to to for a striker to play with him, it was so good. Um, but. Yeah, was we're, we're talking about movement here, or just you know vision technique, bit of everything. He yeah. just like he, he might like be going around the game easy, and then the team might need something, and he'll go take the ball, make a little one-two with someone from deep, attacking, maybe put me in, or he'll have a shot and goal, and we'll get we'll we'll lift the crowd as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, so yeah. You know, but enjoy okay. enjoy the enjoy the, the uh, cigarette. The, the, here's one which the name is kind of forbidden, forbidden. Sorry, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Margatha. Uh, Margatha was just training like a million miles an hour, a million miles an hour training. Um, I think that's right. Like he was captain, so would want to. Be the more he wasn't a typical Portuguese player. He'd be more mm. 
still was de- was had decent technique, but not what you think of when you you're thinking of a Portuguese player. Um, didn't have, he didn't have any little, brown envelopes in his locker, did he? Loved a little um, cool on the head, a like soul glow, soul yeah, glow yeah. like it's coming to America. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Clayton. Clayton was he was a striker's dream because he he's his passing and his vision was so good. His like as a number 10, he was for a striker, he was he was perfect. And the other mm-hmm. thing I loved about him, he'd take the ball anytime. If he if there was a if there was a guy on him, if he's coming like in showing to a midfielder or defender and there's a player from the other team like man marking him he, he wouldn't care if he didn't get the ball and the defender or whatever says oh no you had to throw someone on you he'd be like don't care give it, give me the ball I can, I'll can, i keep it It'll, I'll not lose it and he liked uh, yeah he, he liked life huh? good dancer then yeah good dancer a lot of barbecue Good dancer, good barbecue, good player, good guy. There you go. Lovely. All right, one more name. Matt Derbyshire. Matt Derbyshire. I'm, watching... I'm still sure waiting on Matt. I'm still waiting on his uh, fashion line, to <laughs> his clothing line to, to be released. Wait, hang on, about it. so is this, is this the one they went to Australia for to, to, to flog? Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe, is that, is that one of the reasons? Well, I don't know. I'm asking you. I mean, you, you know him, you've known him longer I just, than I, I have. Know, I just know when I first came over, there was, there was a fashion line clothing in the making. And okay. I've never, right. I've never seen it. I've never but seen any finished product or. May, may, maybe, maybe. Not even, offer, break- not even offered any, not even offered any to promote if they were. If Maybe he's the brains behind Giacomo. You don't know. <laughs> Definitely not him. <laughs> Maybe you should send him an email like you did with Nike. For, to, like, yeah, send him a tweet, yeah. <laughs> yeah like you did with Nike. Yeah, my, Actually, me, me, and my friends, me and my friends, we were joking about that the other day. <laughs> it came up anyway, but I was sent it from. Brilliant. Yeah. Right, I've got some quick fire questions from the Instagram page, and I'm gonna I'm gonna love you. I'm gonna let you. I love you and leave you, or leave you to leave you be, as being the right term, eh? I've already given I've already given Shkembri a shout out, haven't I? Y- yes, yes. I was gonna I, I was gonna ask him being the being one of the names, but you've you've mentioned him. But you can you can talk about him again if you want. I don't mind. Ah uh, no no okay we can continue. I don't want to give him too much. Okay. <laughs> I know he gave he gave me quite a good he gave me quite a good reference on it so. Okay. Was it was his wedding good though? Was his wedding as you expected? His wedding was unbelievable. His wedding yeah. was unbelievable. The was biggest it like wedding, Bexo? Biggest wedding I've ever been to, I think. Everyone yeah. in Malta was there. He's, you haven't uh, been to weddings yeah, in Cyprus yeah, then? Like Posh and Bex, huh? Yeah. All right. All right. I like that. like it. like it. All right. I've got some quick questions. I've got Grigori asking your national team initiation song. What did you do? Uh, my national team initiation song, I done a remix of iPhone oh. 65 Blue. Get out of here. Except when it kicked in, I went, so it goes and you ain't got nobody to listen, to listen. And then I done a little scratch, little turntable scratch, and I went, rrr, rrr, remix. I knew da ba dee da ba Oh, mate. That's that got me. Good. That got me three caps. Yeah, I'm convinced that that initiation song <laughs> won, won over Trapatoni. So yeah. So what blew it though? Was it the voicemail message that you had that completely threw him, the old man? Nah, I think I was out <laughs> before then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll give you that. All right. Okay. Um. How, okay. Someone asked Andrea asked, "How did it feel scoring the win against Jagalonia?" I don't think we really discussed that one, but yeah, how did it feel scoring against the team that you ended up joining? Uh, obviously, at the time, it, I didn't know that, but it felt so good because it was my first goal. Because I'd scored, you like you always just want to get your first goal done and kind of out of the way because you don't want to keep going 
And then it's all, it's all that hangs over your head. Like, fuck, I still, I still haven't scored here. I need to mm. score here. Um, so that was the, like the, the, best thing, the best thing about it um, was that I've scored. And then every, obviously after like we win and we qualify. Uh, but personally at the time, I just, it's like, okay, I can, that's that done. Brilliant. Okay, one more question from Michael, massive fan of yours. He says, what did you like most or what do you like most about Ammonia fans? Right on the fence there. <laughs> um, what do I like most about Ammonia fans? Um, just pa- passionate fans. Passionate fans. You see, it's, um, I know I've said about the pressures on the team and not having that confidence, but it's it's definitely better to be playing with pressure than than without it definitely if you, you it can give you something that for whatever reason something's not happening on the day or you're not feeling you're just not 100 percent. but if you know that pressure that's we, you need to win here then you just you kind of give gives you a little bit more to to dig in for um so it's like i was saying it, it, it can it can be a lot when the team's not doing good, but once the team kind of gets a bit of momentum, then ha- having that it kind of it keeps it it keeps it there. But they came to stop training, didn't they? I remember you messaging me a long time ago. You're like, yeah, you know, they came to a training ground today, and they we had to cancel training because they turned up in their droves. Yeah, but th- like that happened a few times. So at mm. that stage, it wasn't. From, from my experience, it <laughs> happened a few times. It happens. It happens maybe once that well. I don't know if the training was cancelled or they stopped the training, but um, yeah. Look, it's it's their way to let you know that this is this is what's expected, mm. um, and th- this is what we want. And that's what I was saying about the if you're, if there's players that it hasn't happened to before, then it's a big. That's quite a big shock to to your like you majority of people wouldn't have had that in their careers and then for it to happen like that it's a, it would be quite quite a shock for them mm, absolutely well Roy you've got a question haven't you you yeah, showed me earlier sure. yeah explain this Killian please can you explain this uh, just a really good it's just a really good portrait <laughs> Kind of hypnotizes people, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't don't stare at it too long. No, it, it was um, <laughs> I was in Glasgow, and it was a Sunday morning. I think we we were out Saturday night or something, and it was Sunday morning. Got up, had a shower, washed my hair, hair dryer. And then I didn't realize that I'd used um, volumizing shampoo. So that's why it's just went right. like fucking mushroom. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, it was just iconic. Yeah. I've heard. Absolutely. I've heard. And, I've and heard the red jumper. The and the red jumper. Come on now. I've seen the red jumper. The red jumper was... Just for a laugh, really. One of the it's guys. Iconic like, moments, man. This is what you said. The guys was like, "Why don't you wear that?" I'd never thought about it, so I was like, "Okay." okay. <laughs> Brilliant. You became a vegan again. Why? 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 Why did you become a vegan? Was it Floresco that that turned you into a vegan when you were at Omonia? Or was it around that time when you chose to become a vegan? Because I think Floresco is, and he's got like a restaurant or something like that now, and he cooks. That's, was it at the same time? That was Chef Taya done to me. <laughs> <laughs> I loved meat. And then I started getting shoveled with Chef Taya every day and I thought, fuck that, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> no, I, 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 um, I just said I'd try it one day and then felt a difference, felt really good, kept doing it. And then... Pulled in Gio Florescu, got him into my cult. Oh, look at that. 
Kurt Kurt Nelson, Nelson, right? Yeah. Sorry. He didn't. I don't think he even knew I was vegan. He. It was just coincidence that that he started doing it close enough to the time after I did as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> Roy's just baffled. This is a, a Cypriot. What the fuck is this veganism? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm half an Arab as well, so yeah. <laughs> Makes it worse. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, do you still keep in touch with, with guys from like Cyprus? We still got mates here in Cyprus or like, okay. Um, keep uh, in touch. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I talk, yeah, I talked to a few. I talked to Matt. Matt, I'm in contact with a bit. Uh, who else? Um, from Apoel, Antoniades, I speak a bit. Um, Andreas Christofidis, he was he was there at the time. I talked to him a bit. Uh, from Ammonia, uh, Economides, Jurgos. Yeah. Uh, I was I was good friends with him at the time. Skembri, I was talking to after he, I think after I was talking to him on through Instagram after I saw that clip. Mm-hmm. Hey, don't want to miss anyone out. I think that's I think that's it. Is there any other guys? You're gonna get someone messaging you afterwards saying, "Why oh, didn't you mention me?" <laughs> hey, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Beautiful. Okay. I've got I've got a few more questions. If you if you got um, some time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the nickname, sh- the sheriff, is it because of the hair and the hat? No, the sheriff came before the hair. No, the, the long the ah uh, before the long hair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, how did that come up? Who thought of uh, that? Like? So I went. We're on holiday. Uh, in America when I was younger with my friends and basically the next day I've woken up with an actual sheriff's badge a full on real real sheriff's badge and uh, the brown hat to wear yeah. And then just was going around with that for like the rest of the holiday. So if anything was happening, I was just whipping out the the thing. I was like, sure. <laughs> I was I was half expecting you to say then a horse kind of walked out of your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like for about three or four days in America, I was a legitimate a legitimate sheriff. Can you get arrested for that out there? <laughs> Nah, not, not, hey, not if I'm the sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, my uh, one of my friends just called me sheriff one day from Sheridan, Sherry. So he just the first four letters of Sheridan. Yeah. It was the first time anyone had ever said it to me, and he goes, "He just said one day he was like, all right, sheriff." I, thought, <laughs> I like it. I like it. You're gonna you're gonna yeah. still you're gonna resume the podcast though. Nah, don't no? think. Nah, retired. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, yeah. good, man. You, you can be on the that's podcast. Too many. too many now. Yeah. Too many. Too many players doing them now. That's... Yeah, well, yeah, true. True. I, I like the... Um... Don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> There's yeah. quite, quite a lot of decent ones, to be fair. I still listen to them and watch them, but... I don't know. I don't know. I just, I stopped it and then. Well, they kept me entertained at least anyway. So, you know, you got a fan. Appreciate oh, one, it. One ain't bad. One ain't bad. It's one more than what we got. Yeah, brick by brick. <laughs> brick That's it. Brick Rome wasn't built in a day. That's it. <laughs> Very good. Roy, any more? Yeah. Uh, I... mm. mm. want to come Speaking back to Cyprus and play football. Say that again. again? Would you consider coming back to Cyprus to play football? Would you consider that if you got an offer this summer, let's say? Um, Cyprus, you want to come back to? He's been around the world. He's coming back. Yeah, no, I, I loved my time there. It was all the time I've been asked, like, where's the best place I've, I've lived? Almost enjoyed, and I've always said Cyprus. It was 
where I played, probably played some of the best, my best football. Um, really enjoyed my time, like like the people, like the island. Um, so, yeah, I'll, you never know. Uh, okay, one last question for me. Um, obviously, do you still get informed? Do you still watch what's going on? Obviously, you, you know that now Omonia is on top of the league. Do, do you actually follow what's going on here? Do, have you got an idea of what's going on generally? What do you think of the title race this far, do you think? I, I'll follow results and, and stuff like that. Uh, well, actually, no, I, yeah, I've took a bit more of an interest when Mick McCarthy got the Applewell job. And now yeah. they've got Jack Byrne. So mm. kind of, I've kind of watched it a bit more then. Not watching games, but like looking at results and watching the table. Uh, and then like I'll check in on the table and see see how, how it's going. Um, so yeah, I generally, I kind of do that with everywhere I've been. Any like past clubs or, or leagues, I'll I'll keep an eye on on how how things are going. Do you, do you speak to Jack Byrne by any chance? Do you do you know him or do you know anyone that knows him? I didn't know him. I'd never spoke to him, but I was speaking to him after he after he joined. I think it was just right. after just after Mick McCarthy left. Yeah, because I know he had a big big season at Shamrock Rovers, wasn't it? And yeah, then, uh, he left and. They they gave it, they put him on such a pedestal and they're saying, right, you know, why is he going to Cyprus? Why is he going to that league? And to be fair on that, I know he's had injuries, but he struggled to get into the first team. So I think that just shows how competitive the Cypriot league is, irrespective of Aboyle's position. Yeah, yeah. I know he's, he did say that he, he had a, he, did he just get back surgery? Or he had a back up? He, yeah. he had something anyway. He, he did have problems with his back. Yeah, I don't know if he had the surgery though, so I'll, I'll be lying if I said I knew. I just I remember him saying that he had something and then I saw he got surgery or he had an operation or something. So, But um, yeah, th- yeah, that annoyed me when he went there and everyone was like, what's he doing going to Cyprus? It's why, why the, And the, the, the first thing they all say, why doesn't he go over and test himself in, in England again? And... Obviously, like he's he's done that. He's been there. He's, it's just, it's just that attitude towards anywhere outside of the UK or the, any anywhere outside the main four or five leagues in Europe. And it's there. The, there is no football. Football doesn't exist outside of outside of those leagues. Snobbery. Football snobbery. I'm going to say that because. <laughs> That's where my career has been outside those leagues. So. No, but it's, it's fact though, because if you look at, you know, the Cypriot League at this moment in time, all right, fair enough, it's not high quality like, you know, the Bundesliga or the Premier League. But I think it goes to show how well the Cypriot League is improving when you see the likes of Loiso Armone, like Johnny's, like all these other players who've been called up to the Cypriot national team are actually being scouted by teams in England, by teams in Germany. I mean, Benfica are apparently after Loiso, which is remarkable. Who's that? Uh, one of our players, one of our teenagers. Ah yeah, seventeen-year-old yeah youngster who plays for Monia. Yeah, he's been amazing. Yeah, so he's got eyes over a lot of clubs. Olympia, Monaco, Benfica, and Olympiagos. Benfica. So. Nice. Yeah, so, yeah. There you go. Hey. Kill that'd, him, be, that'd be good. That'd be huge for like for Cyprus for the for Cypriot football if that starts to happen more. Eh? 100%. I think the only player we've got abroad is we've got uh, Gastanos, isn't it? That's at, um, uh, you've got Laifis. Laifis, Laifis at standard Liège. Belgium. Yeah, you've got Geros who plays in Bulgaria now. I mean, he, he went to... Went to Copenhagen, didn't he? Copenhagen, yeah, Astana. He went to, and then he went to Astana and now he's in Ludogorets. There are quite a few. Of, there's good talent, man. There's, there's, there's good talent. I believe there's talent in Cyprus. It's just that they never go to it's difficult for them to go to the next level. I mean, up until a certain age, they're, they're really good, but then you have to decide because in Cyprus, it's, it's a total you know, different lifestyle. Yeah. And the lifestyle and the, the options, you know, in Cyprus, if, if you decide you want to go pro and become a football player, then you have, you got to see your future. So some people, you know, they might have the talent up until a certain age, but then they say, you know what, I'm going to go study because uh, I need to have a, a job and get the money. So, 
and they got the army as well. Don't forget, uh, uh, yeah. I guess yeah. all that as well. So yeah, I mean, that's another factor to bear in mind. But yeah, there we go. There we go. Well, Killian, mate, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. We've, we've gone on for close to an hour and a half, man. And um, I know you've got a lot to do this evening. You're an hour ahead of us and Roy's, sorry, you're an hour ahead of me and Roy's an hour ahead of I you. I need to think of stories. That's the rest, <laughs> yeah, of my, the rest of my evening will be me sitting here thinking, why didn't I say that one? We could, you could WhatsApp me a video and I'll put it in the, uh, put it like a, yeah, do a, a Moments later, put it at the end of the show. <laughs> yeah, I might just make up one. To... <laughs> <Go for laughs> <it>. <laughs> well, mate, before before I let you go, can can you do us one last favor? Um, yeah. I'm not. It's not. A, it's not a piss take or anything. Can you do like a, a little? What's how we can we put it, Roy, Roy? Like an introduction. Say so you're you're watching the No Chofdes podcast with Still and Roy on on the OLB. That's it. What does it What does it mean? No No Chofdes. No nonsense. No, no. Ah, okay. Choftes is a, like a village word that they use, you know, but you know, the, the Greeks don't use that, but the Cypriots, we do. No Malakias. No Malakias. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I couldn't That's call it the No Malakias podcast because we wouldn't get any airtime on the radio. You know? <laughs> Malakias is a bit of a swear word. Yes, it is. Well, Malagas is a wanker. So Malakia is the act, it's basically uh, wanker. I thought it was like a like kind of a softer. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it is. I mean, it, it okay, literally, that's what it means, but you use it between mates, but it loses its power when you use it so much. But the, the, the actual meaning is, is ah, okay, yeah, Malaga is, is nonsense, yes, but you can, yeah. you can use it in more like a, an aggressive term as well. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not a corporate word, huh? No, yeah, no, I think, no, 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 I think this is how away with. We can get away with chocolate, days, really. I think this is how we should start the podcast. This last bit about my like <laughs> <It's like> <laughs> <laughs> interview <laughs> with Killian Sheridan. You can, say, you can say welcome to the No Malagias Chop <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, it would be if you, it would be great if you could just say hi, I'm Killian Sheridan. You I'll give you a good story. I'll give okay. you a good wow, story. Great, nice, and it's kind of. It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit Apoel and ammonia. Oh, okay. So when I first went to Cyprus to Apoel, I didn't know really anything about Cypriot football or football in Cyprus, as I've said. And uh, so I didn't know like about Apoel and ammonia or, or this. And uh, the first when I'd signed. I was wearing this green, um, this green designs T-shirt. It had a paisley, a green paisley pattern T-shirt. Okay. So I went into the office, signed the contracts, have the the jersey with the president and all that in the office with this uh, green T-shirt on, and no, no idea what I was doing or what I was doing wrong. And then later on, when they've put up, if you can see my picture they use for when I signed, it's they photoshopped, photoshopped it. <laughs> they photoshopped me onto a <laughs> onto a, a short sleeve black shirt, like <laughs> like terrible, terrible. And I remember all the time thinking, what the fuck? Like why why have they done this? Was the is it because I was wearing a T-shirt or I had to wear a shirt or something? Like, I, could, I couldn't figure out until months later, maybe even a year later, it just hit me one day and I was like, it's because I wore that. I was obviously wearing a green T-shirt. <laughs> and, and another day in, in the dressing room, I had a Boston Celtics basketball <laughs> shorts when I first came. And I was walking around the place, like, with these shorts on. And uh, Mario, Mario Sergio, the Portuguese player that was at Apoel, one day goes to me, what are you doing? You, you crazy? You stupid? <laughs> <laughs> can't be wearing these. And I must, this must have been like two or three weeks in. And I, I, was, I, I was walking around everywhere with them. Oh, mate. You should have gone with the Celtic t-shirt as well, man, which has the, the charm mark as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the, I mean, the Boston Celtics one has a big has a yeah. big shamrock on the front. 
But yeah, it was a. Uh, I, Mate, I, I remember when Mick McCarthy got the uh, the Abu Al job and they announced it on Twitter and I looked at the timeline and all the replies were people from Ireland, Irish supporters with well done Mick and then they put the, the, the three leaf clover. I'm like, oh, yeah, you yeah. don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Lost, lost in translation or not knowing the, uh, the culture, but hey, again, Killian, yeah. thank you very much for your time, man. Appreciate it. That was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, man. Thank you um, so much, Killian. No, no, no. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Just wish I could have told some fucking stories. Nah, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, what but if, what, 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 still, what still said? Huh? Say? What'd you say? No, I, 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 some stories that I can say. We, we're still going to edit this and then upload it. So if you, if you think of anything, just record yourself and send it to Stella and, and we can put it on. <laughs> Roy, wrap it up, Philemon. Okay. Pame shinakamu omoni ala os prodassi va kilian. I thought of something funny, thought of a relatively funny story for you, ammonia, all ammonia related, um, and it's with someone who I didn't mention as well, uh, Marine Ursulich, who I'm quite f- still friendly with, and back then was, was good friends with him. We went to, we had a maybe international break, and we decided we'd go to Athens for the two days the two of us were there on our own so we said right we'll go to Athens for the two days or three days whatever it was and when we were talking about it the Aris Soliedis the left back who was the Greek guy who was there was all heard us talking about it and he was also going back to Greece back to Athens so he's like yeah come back we'll, we'll all get in the same flight and I can take you to stay in mine for the weekend whatever uh, my car will be there at the airport can take you can take you in no problem you don't have to get taxis so we're like okay yeah pretty pretty sound let's do that so we arrive at, at Athens airport his car now there's Soliedis who's obviously driving because it's his car and then me and Marin who are were probably the two tallest players in the team and he arrives with his car was, it was in the airport car park, a smart car. <laughs> so there was him driving and me and Marion had to figure out how the two of us could sit in the front seat of a smart car. And anyway, we managed to do it and we're fucking having to drive around Athens when we were going like to, for food and stuff into a, in a, in a smart car. And even better... Later on in the day, me and Marin were like, Aris, we can't continue like this. We need to maybe rent a new car or something. So Aris was speaking with Clayton and Clayton left his car in Greece the whole time. He didn't bring it. He had a, an R8, Audi, 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 whatever you say, R8. And Clayton was like, yeah, just take mine if you want. It's no one's using it. So Aris, is, so we didn't know this was Clayton's car. And Aris was saying to us, okay, I spoke with Clayton. He said we can have his car. So we're like, oh, brilliant, brilliant. We need, it. we need a bigger car. So anyway, picks up the R8. It's a two-seater again. And probably less space. So uh, yeah, that's a, hopefully that's a little bit of a, a funny story. And um, also I should have given a shout out to uh, Rushias, who was at Ammonia. I was friendly with him and talked to him every now and again. And... I saw he's having a good season this year back in the national team, so good to see you.